We're looking at Matthew chapter 6. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has just finished giving us the Lord's Prayer. And the next verse, this is what he says. He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The last Sabbath we began a new series entitled Living in Forgiveness. And we would begin with sort of an overview of what a forgiven person looks like. It's sort of a, this is what they look like, this is how they live, this is what they don't look like, kind of message. And today I would like for us to move further into that topic by defining in a very specific way what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not. And that's a valuable discussion because sometimes forgiveness is hard to understand. And, when, and, it, and it's, when something is hard to understand, it makes it harder to do, right? And I say, sometimes forgiveness is hard to understand. People say, what's the hard about it? You just forgive. Okay, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? What exactly are the mechanics of forgiveness? If, if someone comes up to you and says, you know, you need to be more forgiving, what does that mean exactly when you try to apply that in a real world setting? You see, this is actually a good principle of life and relationship management. That whenever we talk about something, particularly if it's hard to understand, we should probably do a stop, look, and listen, which means that we should stop, we should slow down, and we should first define our term to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Have you ever had this experience where you're talking with someone, and you're using a word, and they're talking, and they're using the same word, but it feels like we're talking past each other, we're just not doing any good on this conversation. And the conversation begins to escalate, and escalate, and escalate, and as you listen, you begin to realize that even though we're using the same word, we attach different definitions to the word. We attach different pieces of baggage to that word, and we're not really talking about the same thing, even though we're using the same terminology. So whenever we're talking about something that's complicated or hard to understand or potentially confusing, it's good for us to first stop and then define our terms and make sure that we understand clearly what it is that we're speaking about. So I want us to do that today. I want us to ask this question, what exactly is forgiveness? And what does forgiveness look like? What are some of the things that often pass for forgiveness that really are not forgiveness? Do you think there's some of those things out there? Do you think sometimes someone thinks they're being forgiving? Or, or, or they're, they're trying to extend forgiveness? And what they're actually doing is really not forgiveness? Do you think? Like I said, sometimes forgiveness is a little confusing and hard to understand. What are, what are some of the common mistakes that people make when they think about forgiveness, when they try to, to offer, to give forgiveness, or even to seek forgiveness from others. Now, I'm indebted to R.T. Kendall for much, indebted to R.T. Kendall for much of what we shared today. R.T. was pastor of the Westminster Chapel in London, England for many years, and he recently wrote a book entitled Total Forgiveness. It's a book that is, um, reads very well, it comes highly recommended. And in his book, he has a couple of lists that we're going to follow and see where these lists take us. And he starts off by defining what forgiveness is not. And then he talks about what forgiveness is. Here's what R.T. says. First thing that R.T. says, forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not approval of what the offender did. It's not, for, it's not approval of what the offender did. Now, sometimes we do this as a way of sort of minimizing our own pain. Oh, yeah, it's okay. It's no big deal. Right? When the truth is, it's a very big deal. Very big deal. I had a discussion with someone once, and we were talking about church stuff. He says, you know, that guy over there, and he was referring to a church leader. He says, that guy over there, you know, he, was, he was really mean. He was really rude. He was really unkind to me and my family. Oh, but it doesn't bother me. It's just it's no big deal. Oh, but you know what he did? Oh, but it's okay. And I remember thinking, you know, there's an incongruency there. You're minimizing this offense because you're trying to manage your own pain. But the truth is that that was, that was significantly hurtful. I had the opportunity to get those two together, and the person that offended him didn't know that he offended him. And within five minutes, they had the whole thing worked out. And this guy no, had to, no longer had to walk around his church with that hurt feeling toward a church leader that he saw all the time because there was just some communication that was needed on this little issue that was taking place there. You see, sometimes we try, to, we try to rise above it, so to speak, 
it, as if that's a really spiritual thing, to just offer approval for what they do. But God hates sin. And we don't find a model for the approval of sin in Scripture. If we did, you know, the Bible would be a very short book. Just two chapters. But in Genesis chapter 3, this th sin thing happened. And because of that, we have the rest of the volume. And we have this whole great controversy that rages on today. The whole point of the volume of Scripture and the history that we experience today is that God does not approve of sin. And so we should not approve of sin and evil. I think sometimes people do this as a way of trying to help the offender feel better about what they've done. And while that may be a good intention, it is a misguided one. And as we'll see today, there's a better option that is available to us. Number two, forgiveness is not excusing what they did. First off, it's not approval of what they did. Secondly, it's not excusing what they did. We don't cover the sins of other people. We don't point to circumstances in an attempt to explain away their behavior. We find this in the book of Numbers chapter 14. It's really a sad story, Numbers chapter 14. God has freed the children of Israel from slavery. He has, through this miraculous, incredible series of miracles and, and events, He has liberated them from slavery, and He has moved a million plus people through the desert with miracle after miracle after miracle of His faithfulness. They had no money, they had no resources, they had no food, they had no water, they had no supply line, they had nobody helping them, and they were able to make this trek through the desert, a period of hundreds of miles of many months of journey, and they're on their way to this place that God calls the promised land. God calls it a land of milk and honey. And they literally come up to the very border of this promised land, and they're about ready to go in and take this promised land that God has promised them, and they send in 12 spies. And the 12 spies come home to report on the land, and 10 of the spies said, you know what, everything you heard about that land was true, except the people of the land, they're like giants. We were like grasshoppers on the side. And there were two other spies there, Caleb and Joshua, they said, you know what, what those guys said is true, but God is on our side. God will deliver us. The God of heaven will give us success. Just look at the history of God's faithfulness. Look at how he freed us from Egypt. Look at how he's cared for us in the desert. Look at how he's given us water and how he's given us food and how we've conquered all of our enemies. God is faithful to us. We can take the land with God on our side. And the Bible says that the people almost stopped. Can you imagine the two low voices that were speaking sanity and that were willing to recount the story of God's goodness and God's faithfulness? And the Bible says that people almost stoned them. Look at uh, Numbers 14, verse 18 says, Moses is talking and he says, The Lord is long-suffering, he is abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generation. God doesn't excuse the sin. It, it, to, to mean that God doesn't just ignore the sin. He doesn't approve the sin. He doesn't just excuse the sin. We don't cover for the sins of other people. But look at verse 19. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray. According to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Forgiveness is not excusing sin. We don't cover the sins of other people. Forgiveness takes place in a context of reality. But even in that context of reality, there is forgiveness from sin. Number three, forgiveness is not justifying what they did. The Oxford English Dictionary defines justify as showing a person to be right or just or reasonable. And by looking back over these first three, forgiveness is not approving, it's not excusing, or it's not justifying. You kind of start to get a feel for where we're going here. Forgiveness is a reality-based action. Forgiveness lives in the real world. True forgiveness is willing to look at something squarely and honestly and to identify it accurately, but then still forgive. That's what we're talking about when we use the term forgiveness. Number four, forgiveness is not pardoning what they did. And once again, the definition of the word is important here. A pardon is a legal transaction that releases the offender from the consequences of their action, such as a penalty or a sentence. That's what a pardon is. So, we can, we can completely forgive the guilty rapist while being supportive of the judicial punishment that is levied upon them. 
He needs to pay his debt to society, and society must be protected from him. We can fully offer forgiveness while separating the forgiveness from the consequences. We can fully offer the forgiveness while being supportive of the judicial punishment and of the consequences that would come to that individual. Number five, forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. Why? We touched on this last Sabbath. Because reconciliation requires the participation of two people. If you think back over your own experience, you could probably come up with a time when you extended an apology to someone and they slapped your hand away. They would not accept it. Does that mean, mean then that you haven't forgiven them because there could not be reconciliation? Well, of course not. Last week someone pointed out that if a person dies, obviously there can't be reconciliation. But just because a person dies does not mean that we can't forgive them. Death cannot keep us from forgiving other people. In addition, reconciliation may not always be the healthiest or the wisest thing to do. Sometimes after a hurtful event, it's necessary to establish a boundary that is going to change the dynamics of the relationship. And in that situation, reconciliation may not be the emotionally safe or the physically safe option. Number six, forgiveness is not denying what they did. Repressing what we really feel inside has negative consequences to our psychological well-being. Repression cannot remove or heal a wound. Therefore, it doesn't lead to healing. Someone shared this illustration with me one time. It's a little bit like if you go to the beach to enjoy a day at the beach, and you have a beach ball, and you're out in the water and you're playing with a beach ball, and someone walks by, and for whatever reason, you don't want them to see your beach ball. You don't want them to know that you have a beach ball. And so what do you do with the beach ball? You push the beach ball under the water, and you hide the beach ball under the water. Now, can you do that? Yes. Will they see the beach ball? No. Will you be having any fun? No. Can you do that forever? No. <laughs> Eventually, you'll get tired. What will happen? Ooh. Out this side, or out that side, you'll lose the beach ball, it'll get a little wonky, you'll lose the balance. And it will pop up. Eventually, you'll be exposed for hiding the beach ball. Right? Also, while you're hiding the beach ball, what are all the things that you're supposed to be doing that you're not doing? Having fun! You didn't go to the beach to manage your beach ball and to hide your beach ball. And you're like, I don't have a beach ball. Right? You went to the beach to have fun. You went to play in the waves and to run around and to swim and to play frisbee and fly kites and make sandwiches on the beach. You know? You're not getting to do any of those things while you're hiding the beach ball. That's a little bit like how repression works in our lives. You can do that for a period of time, but it has dire consequences. And the emotional energy that it needs to be devoted to repressing that issue it sort of alters the course of the rest of your life in a way that's not the best. Number seven, forgiveness is not blindness to what happened. This is different from repression. In that repression is often an unconscious decision but blindness is conscious with the same negative result. Number eight, forgiveness is not forgetting. On the way, preacher, that sounds very unspiritual. What about this little what about this little cliche in our culture? You gotta forgive and forget. Isn't that a good thing to just forgive and forget? What, what do you mean forgiveness is not forgetting? Let's let's just be honest about this one. Let's think it through logically. It may not be realistic to be able to forgive. You see, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to make myself forget something. When I have a personal experience, and I've been through an experience, particularly if it's a big experience, particularly if it's a very wounding experience to me, if it was a very hurtful thing, I don't know how to just say, I forget that. Now, I can choose not to, to ruminate. I can choose not to react in an ungodly way. I can choose not to recount the story over and over and over again. I can choose not to make that past experience also my present experience, because it overcomes me and overwhelms me, but I really don't know how to just sort of up and say, oh, I, I forget that, okay? I don't know how that works. Does God do that? The, the Bible says he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Does God forget? Can God forget something? God is omniscient. What that means is that he's all-knowing. You see, one of the advantages of being God is, is you never lose your cell phone. You never misplace your keys. 
You never forget to do something that was on your to-do list. God does not forget something. Now, He removes our sin from us, but that's different than forgetting. And by the way, I love that text of Scripture. You know why it says He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west? You know why it says the east from the west and not the north from the south? You ever thought about that? If you go north far enough, what are you going to find? The North Pole. If you're standing on the North Pole and you take a step in any direction, any direction at all, what direction are you going? South. You see, there's an end of north. Just like there's an end of south. But there is no end of east. And there's no end of west. God removes our sin from us, but that's different than really forgetting the sin. Alright? So to say, well, you haven't forgiven someone unless you have forgotten the sin, we need to be careful about what's being taught or what's being implied in a statement like that. Number nine, forgiveness is not refusing to take the wrong seriously. We cannot truly forgive until we see clearly the offense that we are forgiving. Besides, forgiving the actual offense as opposed to the watered-down version is a much more precious gift to the individual. This is what God does. There is no sin that is too great for him to forgive, but he knows exactly what we've done. And he's forgiving the sin in a context of reality. This makes grace and forgiveness even more precious. We don't have to hide the reality or the violence of our sin from God. I love this story in Luke 7. I love this story. Jesus is at Simon's house, and this woman comes in. Now remember, this is a culture where men and women, they don't interact a lot in public settings. And this woman comes in uninvited, and she approaches the guest, which was a cultural taboo. And she takes this alabaster jar, and guess where she got the money for the alabaster jar? From prostitution. And she breaks the jar of and she touches Jesus' feet, which is absolutely inappropriate. And it is inappropriate for a man to allow a woman who is a prostitute to touch his feet in a public setting. You understand that the social taboos in this story are just off the chart. And she touches his feet, and she bathes his feet, and then she dries his feet with her hair. You understand, that's, that's a little bit intimate. And, and, and it's a little bit... Um, Sensual. And all the guests were just going, Ooh! because on multiple levels, this was just wrong. And here's what Jesus says Jesus says, He who has been forgiven much loves much. They're all going, She's the worst sinner in the whole room. And Jesus says, Right. And you know what that means? It means that she loves more than any of you are capable of. You see how the gospel does this regenerative work in a person's heart and a person's life. Amen. The worse of a sinner you are, the greater God's grace is in your behalf. The greater your testimony. The greater your ability to be a witness and to be a light for the kingdom. You see, in the presence of God, we don't have to hide who we are we were, or what we did, or what our impressive resume of being a sinner was. Even the heavy Mac Daddy things on our resume of sinner, we don't have to hide those from God. In fact, those things simply accentuate the grace of God and the goodness of God. Are, are you the worst sinner around? Are you the worst sinner in the church? Are you the worst sinner in your family? Were you the, were you the black sheet of your graduating high school class? You know what that means? It means that God has, has now positioned you to love Him more than anyone else in the world. When we give our hearts to Him, the thing that was, our, that was our greatest detriment can become our greatest blessing and our greatest moment of testimony. Number 10. Forgiveness is not pre pretending that we are not hurt. It is ridiculous to think that we should have to keep a stiff upper lip when we have been injured by a spouse's infidelity or betrayed, or molested, or unjustly criticized. God let David know how grieved he was over David's sin of adultery and murder. God didn't pretend not to be hurt. 
He didn't say, oh, that's okay. It's no big deal. I'll repress it or prove it or excuse it. God didn't do any of that. God spoke very openly and very honestly about David and about the impact that that would have on David's family and about the impact that that would have on David's relationship with God and about the impact that that had on disturbing David's prayer and worship. They dealt with that in the context of reality. Jesus was obviously hurt when he was struck in the face by the high priest's official. He even asked him, why did you strike me? So real and total forgiveness is acquainted with reality. It doesn't deny, ignore, repress, water down, overlook, or otherwise steer around what has happened. Those are just a few thoughts on what forgiveness is not. But now let's talk about what forgiveness is. As we're moving toward a clear, working definition of forgiveness, let's talk about what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is, number one, being aware of what someone has done and still forgiving. I find something very freeing in that. It is achieved only when we acknowledge that what was done, acknowledge what was done without any denial, without any cover-up, and we still refuse to make the offender pay for their crime. That's forgiveness. Number two, forgiveness is choosing to keep the record of wrongs. This comes from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Why do we keep track of the times that we are offended? To use them. To prove what happened. To weigh them before someone who doubts our viewpoint. A husband may say to his wife, Oh, I remember that. And he does. And she may say, Oh, I'll never forget this. And she doesn't. Forgiveness is a choice to tear up the record of wrongs that we've been keeping. And at first it's not a feeling, but rather an act of the will. And the feelings may fall away. Now how does that coexist, being aware of what someone has done? Well, first we see it, we clearly acknowledge what it has done to us, and then we erase it before it becomes a permanent, debilitating fixture in our mind. If we don't, it becomes lodged in our hearts, and this decaying process starts. It's bad for us. It's bad for our marriages. It's bad for our kids. It's bad for our churches. And when we choose not to keep a record of wrongs on a regular basis, we avoid bitterness, and eventually we experience this feeling of total forgiveness. Now, let's change gears on that one. Because though this is very important, it has to be tempered with wisdom. We don't interpret number two as a lack of boundaries. We still learn from the past. We take the past into account in a way of organizing the future of that relationship. Because that helps us be successful in the future of that relationship. It means that we don't hold our hearts as collateral for future arguments or weapons to be used in the future. But it doesn't mean, oh, it's like it never happened and and I haven't learned anything from it. And I'm going to continue to place myself in the exact same position, which in a sense is inviting that same offense to reoccur. Number three, refusing to punish. This is an important one. Refusing to punish those who deserve it. Giving up the natural desire to give them what's coming to them is the very essence of true forgiveness. Our human nature has a hard time with that one. Alone. We have a hard time with the thought that, you know, they're going to walk. They may actually get away with this. And it seems unfair. You know why it seems unfair? Because it is unfair. And we want vengeance. Here's a fresh thought. Do you want them to be punished? I mean, really good. Do you want them to have what's coming to them? Do you want just that feeling of, yeah, there needs to be some payback on this one? Here's a fresh thought. They have. They already have. That's what the gospel teaches. They already have in Christ. 
Because he died in their place and he accepted the blame for their offense. In fact, they were punished badly in Christ. We can release people from our need to punish them when we realize that Christ has already accepted the blame of their deeds in their behalf. Now, he died for what they did. And that's pretty severe punishment. In our culture, there's not a lot of things that, that you die for as a penalty for your sins. Right? There's a whole lot of different punishments that can be levied out for people's sins. But there's just a couple of the Mac Daddy sins that you actually die for. Christ died to accept the blame for their sins. So part of true forgiveness is that we allow the gospel to work in their behalf. We allow the cross of Christ to pay the penalty and to accept the vengeance that we may feel toward the person that we're offended at. Now, sometimes we just fear that, well, God may not do it right. God might be a little help with this one. We fear that God may not step in the way he needs to and give our enemies their just reward. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 35, God is speaking and he says, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. This verse has been cited twice more in the New Testament. You see, God doesn't need our help in this area. So when we refuse to be the instrument of punishment, it sets God free to decide what needs to be done. According to his master plan, he who sees the end from the beginning, he who understands how that discipline and how that, that punishment and how that blame will impact that person's life in a way that encourages them back toward the kingdom of God. God doesn't need our help in this area. Number four, forgiveness is resisting the urge to tell what they did. Why do we tell? To hurt. Telling is usually an act of aggression. We use it to punish and to ruin a reputation. We divulge what that person did so that others will think less of them. The exception would be when we're talking to a trusted friend or counselor for therapeutic reasons. Number five, forgiveness is being merciful. Mercy is the opposite of wrath or justice. So when we show mercy, we are withholding justice from those who have injured us. Number six, forgiveness is being gracious. True forgiveness shows grace and mercy at the same time. This is done by withholding certain facts that you know to be true, so as to leave your enemy's reputation unscathed. Graciousness is shown by what you don't say, even if it could be true. In Hellenistic literature, this idea was to not take a, right, a rigorous stand against your enemy, even if you know that you're in the wrong. Right. That was the idea behind being gracious. Number seven, forgiveness is an inner condition. This reminds us that forgiveness has to take place on the inside as well as the outside. It has to be more than just disciplining ourselves not to talk bad about someone. Now, is there value in that? Is there value in disciplining ourselves not to talk bad about someone? Yes. But forgiveness also has to be an inner condition. You see, just disciplining ourselves not to talk bad about someone, that's called lifestyle modification. And here's the deal. Lifestyle modification, behavior modification, it doesn't produce righteousness. Where did we learn that? The life of Jesus. Jesus regularly interacted with these people who were experts. They were experts at modifying their lifestyles. They were called the Pharisees. And they, they had this thing down to a science. They had it down to a perfection. Interesting, as you look at the life of Jesus, he was harder on that group than anyone else. Jesus was harder on that group than the people who were these bold-faced, unapologetic sinners. Jesus was harder on that group. Jesus' harshest words were against those who thought that lifestyle modification would produce righteousness and would make them acceptable in the sight of God. So, so it's important for us to discipline ourselves, to discipline our mouths and our minds and, and, and the things that we say to people. But forgiveness is also an inner condition. Number eight, 
Number eight, forgiveness is the absence of bitterness. This is also an inward condition. Bitterness is an excessive desire for vengeance that comes from deep resentment. This one leads the list of things that grieve the Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians. This one manifests itself in many ways. Losing your temper, high blood pressure, irritability, sleeplessness, obsession with getting even, depression, isolation, and the list goes on. Getting rid of bitterness is one of those deals where you just start to do it and then the feelings come later. But first it starts here. It doesn't start here. First it starts here. You choose to do the right thing even though you don't feel like it. Your head has to lead in this one, not your heart. You choose to do the right thing even though you don't feel like it. And then your feelings catch on and your feelings come later. And how do we know when bitterness is gone? It's gone when there's no desire to get even punish the offender, when I say or do nothing that will hurt their reputation, and I truly wish them well in all that they see for all that they do. Number nine, forgiveness is forgiving God. That was a little different. We always think of forgiveness as something that God's doing for us, or something that we do on a horizontal level for each other. But we don't often think about how we have to forgive God. But we're actually in a position many times where we have to forgive God. Because bitterness is often aimed at God. Deep in our hearts we believe that, that He is the one that allowed these things to happen to us. Why God? After all, He could have prevented it. He is all powerful. He's all knowing. So in some sense does it make sense to believe that God is responsible then for our hurt? And this is a real hard one for us. Good people don't want to believe that they have any bitterness toward God. So this is often repressed. After all, all things work together for good, don't they? I think that is the most misunderstood and misquoted verse in the whole Bible. I really do. That verse does not say that God is the author of evil and hurtful things that take place in our lives. That is not what the verse is saying. Satan is responsible for evil and for hurt and sadness and disappointment. That is a result of sin. That comes from the, from the father of lies. What the verse says is this. When it says all things work together for good, what the verse is saying is that even in the midst of life's greatest challenges, God is present and he is active and he is working for your good. It does not say that God is the author of the hurtful things that take place. What do we do with this? Bitterness toward God. Blaming God. I mean, God could have intervened and he didn't slap me at God. What do we do? One suggestion is to accept that God is God. That in his omniscience, that in his bigness, that in the, the eternalness of who God is, that he knows exactly what he is doing now. For all of us who struggle with God's right to allow evil to exist in the world, there must be some genuine forgiveness on our part for any bitterness toward God. We therefore must forgive Him for allowing evil to touch our lives. Even though it wasn't His fault, it was not His idea, He's not the one that's guilty. It's appropriate for us to just think through that spiritual task and that emotional process of forgiving God. Number 10, lastly, forgiveness is forgiving ourselves. Forgiveness then is totally forgiving others and God for allowing it to happen. But it is also forgiving ourselves. There is no lasting joy in forgiveness if it does not include forgiving yourself. Not forgiving ourselves is as wrong as not forgiving others. Because God loves you as much as He loves them. We matter to God. And He doesn't want us punishing ourselves any more than He wants us punishing others. Some years ago, a frail black woman rose slowly to her feet in a South African courtroom. She was seven years old. Facing her from across the room 
were several white security officers, one, Mr. Vanderbilt, who had just been found guilty of murder of the woman's husband and her son. The man had come into the woman's home years earlier. He'd taken her son and shot him. And burned his body. Several years later, Vanderbrook had returned to take away her husband. For two years, she had learned nothing of what happened to him. Then Vanderbrook came back for the woman herself. She was led to a place beside the river. And there she saw her husband, bound and beaten up, and laying on a pile of wood. The last words that she heard before they doused him with gasoline and set him on fire, were, Father, forgive them. But not long ago, justice caught up with Mr. Vanderbilt. He had been found guilty, and it was time to determine his sentence. And as the woman stood, the court's judge asked, So what do you want? How should justice be done to this man who so brutally destroyed your family. In reply, the woman said, I want three things. First, I want to be taken to the place where my husband's body was burned so that I can gather up the dust and give his remains a decent burial. Second, my husband and my son were my only family. So I want Mr. Vanderbroek to become my son. I would like for him to come twice a month to the ghetto where I live and spend a day with me so that I can pour out on him whatever love I still have remaining in me. And finally, she said, I want a third thing. I would like Mr. Vanderbroek to know that I offer him my forgiveness. Because Jesus died to forgive. This was also the wish of my husband. And so I would kindly ask someone to come to my side and lead me across the courtroom so that I can take Mr. Vanderbroek in my arms and embrace him and let him know that he is truly forgiven. As the court assistants led the elderly woman across the courtroom, Mr. Vanderbroek, overwhelmed by what he heard, fainted. And then quietly, from those in the courtroom, friends, family, neighbors, all victims of similar oppression and injustice, there came a song. They began to sing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. that I am preaching to a very quiet congregation this morning. The truth is, we've done some hard work in here today. And just as I've looked into the eyes of these worshipers, different parts of this sermon, 